Hello, my friends. My name is Darren Gertis, and this is The Daily Brief. I'm going to start here with the losses, but I don't want to focus on the losses of Russian soldiers so much as other numbers here. Uh, I saw this interesting little stat on the Defense of Ukraine website, uh, 13,000 Russian vehicles destroyed. Go back and look at it again, 13,011. They just passed that threshold. That means about 17, 18 per day. And that's not counting tanks. That's not counting armored vehicles, which doubles the number. And like that's a lot of losses over time. Remember, this is day two of year three of this horrible war. Okay, next. Uh, I showed you yesterday a number of places around the world, France and England and other countries around the world that were lit up. I didn't show you places like in the United States, like Colorado, uh, Denver City and Denver Building lit up in support of Ukraine as well. And then we saw this, and I, I don't know if this is even real. Maybe this is AI. Somebody tell me if this is legitimate, but Dr. Ian Gardner had nothing says bad guy vibes like building a temple of war in your capital and lighting it up like this. I'm not sure what to make of this. Put this in the comments below if you are, you know, can show me that this is verifiable. It, it just strikes me as like almost AI. Like, really? Okay. Anyway, let's keep going. There are also uh, protests in support of Ukraine all over the world. Yesterday, London, this was uh, Berlin, this was happening in D.C. as well. And so there's a lot of support for Ukraine. I first saw this on Twitter, but it's in the Kiev Independent. Ukrainian crowdfunding campaign raises $7.8 million for sea drone fleet in record 36 hours. Well, yeah, because the sea drones have had impact. They've been able to uh, take the fight to the enemy and show good results. So it doesn't surprise me at all that they raised that much money in that little time. Okay, let's look at the Moscow Times. Ukraine claims drone strike on major Russian steel plant. Now, this wasn't yesterday. It was the day before, and it just wasn't covered because of all the events that were happening yesterday, focusing on major things. And it's not that this isn't major. It's just it got crowded out. So there's a fire at this steel plant. Ukraine on Saturday said it hit one of Russia's largest steel plants with a drone strike on the second anniversary of Moscow's launching its invasion. Russia reported a fire in the huge factory in western Lipinsk region. The drone strike on the steel plant was organized by two Ukrainian special services at once, the SBU and the GUR, the SBU said on its website. NLMK calls itself Russia's biggest producer of steel. So that's kind of important. And where is it relative to Ukraine? Well, this is the district. It's in the western side. And here's Moscow. Here's Ukraine. So you can kind of get a sense of how far it is away. <clears throat> but if they're attacking steel factories and oil production and liquefied natural gas, it won't be very long before it's going to be very hard for Russia to produce things. My guess is they're going to start producing things further and further east to make it more difficult to attack, but that's also going to provide problems of its own for both the attacker and the defender. Okay, uh, yesterday we saw this as well, skepticism over Ukraine aid pervasive at CPAC. CPAC is a conservative political action conference, and it is a, a very uh, important conference to Republicans. A vocal faction of the Republican Party are pushing back against giving more money to Ukraine, as lawmakers argued at CPAC that the U.S. needs to focus more on domestic issues like border security. Now, if you don't think that border security is a legitimate important issue. It really is to Republicans. It doesn't mean that they shouldn't be doing Ukraine aid too. They absolutely should. I showed this um, article yesterday. This was uh, Brooks and uh, Capehart on U.S. aid for Ukraine wavering. And I, I gave one comment here. This <laughs> I'll read it again because it's worth it. This is David Brooks. He's a New York Times columnist. Brooks says, if you told me two years ago that Europe would be united and strong and in support, even though they were so dependent on Russian energy, and that we'd be the faltering ones, and that the faltering ones within our country were Republicans, I wouldn't have believed you. Because historically, Republicans tend to be the hawks. Okay, but 
the border is important. And this is David Brooks again saying, if you ask, who do you approve on 12 different issues? On general competency, Trump's up by like 12 points. On who can handle the economy better, Trump's up by 25. Now, if you're a liberal, you might not believe this, but if you are a conservative, you're angry about the economy. Some liberals are like, no, the economy's good, the economy's great, stock market's up. Okay, the stock market's up, but every time you go to Walmart, if you're angry, the stock market doesn't matter. Okay, Trump is up by 25 points. On immigration, he's up by 39 points. So immigration uh, on the border, on those kind of things, like it's really important. Now, you need to do that, but you need to do that too, not in place of. I think that it's absurd for us to devote so many resources, so much attention, and so much time to a border conflict 6,000 miles away when our own U.S. southern border is wide open, says Senator J.D. Vance. Okay, now J.D. Vance has never been in support of Ukraine aid. He's always been uh, taking this position, but that's what he was saying at CPAC. Decide, Joe Biden, which country matters more to you, the border of the United States or the border of Ukraine, Representative Byron Donald of Florida said. But that's not the whole of the Republican Party. Let's move on. Uh, what happened last night, South Carolina, here's how Trump won in South Carolina. Now, it, Nikki Haley was not going to win, and it's her home state because of Trump. Now, Trump cruised a victory in the South Carolina primary with the support of an almost unwavering base of loyal voters. Now, let's stop there for a moment. There's something that I teach in my classes. Uh, it comes from Cruz's and Postner. They talk about um, if you don't believe the messenger, you won't believe the message. Okay, And so many of you are like that with Trump. But it's if you reverse that, if you believe the messenger, you believe the message, that's where the loyal MAGA base is. They have bought Trump and now whatever he says is like golden and that's where they are. It's it's almost like the personality is more important than the, the principles. And I'm going like, wait a minute, that, those aren't my principles. What's going on? But people who have bought him buy whatever he has to say. Many questions. Uh, many question the value of supporting Ukraine's fight against Russia, and overwhelming majorities see immigrants again as hurting the U.S. This is the border issue, and suspect that there are nefarious political motives behind Trump's multiple criminal indictments. I've been saying this and saying this and saying this. Every time that Trump goes to court, gets a, a, a verdict against him in court, they suspect that it's politically motivated. It may not be, but they see it as politically motivated and that makes them have greater resolve for Trump, the people that are already kind of in his corner. Now, the upside of that is that that's the hardcore base. That's not everybody else. In the United States, there's roughly a little less than a third that is Democrat, a little less than a third that's Republican, and then a third or so that is independent. And it's independents that are actually going to determine the election, whether we vote for Biden or the Republican. Uh, okay, so the hardcore base, Trump's hardcore base, they're very hardcore. Um, I'm not so sure that they on the Democrat side, they're that hardcore for Biden. I think they're really thinking, mm, you know, he's kind of old, but we don't want to lose him. Uh, I think that's kind of where they are. I could be wrong about that. You can tell me if I'm wrong. But the, those on the right side of the spectrum that support Trump, they really support Trump. Now, there are conservatives like me who do not support Trump, who would vote for Haley, who have voted for Haley. About 6 in 10 South Carolina voters consider themselves supporters of the Make America Great Again movement. So that's the Trump supporters. And again, these are 6 in 10 Republicans voting in the Republican primary, not 6 in 10 of the overall state. Haley's voters were much more divided. About half were motivated by supporting her. They really want Haley. And about nearly as many turned out to oppose Trump. And those two groups got together. And now here's the thing that it didn't say. It didn't say that, and I saw the statistic last night as I was watching the news, the, the results come in. It didn't say that 60% of those Haley voters say they will not vote for Trump in the general election. Now, a good portion of that will come home whenever the Republican Party, you know, votes against the 
bad Democrats over there, just like the Democrats vote against the bad Republicans over there. That's how it normally works. But I think there really will be less turnout if Trump is the nominee. Okay, one more article and then we'll be done. Uh, Ukrainian pilot says flying awesome F-16s is like upgrading from an old Nokia phone to an iPhone. Here, the pilot saying this, Ukrainian pilot said that transitioning from old Soviet-made planes to Western F-16s is like upgrading from a Nokia to an iPhone. The pilot with the call sign Moonfish is one of the six being trained to use the fighter jets at this particular base in Denmark. It's a really awesome jet to fly. He told Ukrainian government-backed platform United24. He said that while F-16s are much easier for pilots, it's been challenging adapting to the more advanced electronic systems on the aircraft. He compared it to transitioning from a basic phone like a Nokia to an iPhone without all those steps in between. Moonfish said that the jet was more agile than the MiG he flew before, adding, it feels like the jet just wants you to fly more aggressively. Okay, well good, we'll get to that soon. We'll, we'll, we'll see those F-16s, but where have they been? It's been so long. We're two years into the war and they're not onto the into the fight yet. So... This is because our politicians dithered in the early days and Vladimir Putin actually did a pretty good job of dissuading us from providing the aid that we needed to provide. Okay, last little bit here. Uh, coming soon, there'll be a collaboration with Zach the Russian. I met him yesterday. We got to sit down over lunch and uh, just talk for a good long while. Um, and yeah, so we're going to be talking. So what, what would you like to know from Zach when I interview him? Put that in the comments in the community tab and thank you for your time, the likes, the shares, and the subscribes. And thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.